Well, we are in week two of At the Feet of Jesus. So we're going to be opening up our Bibles together this evening, and we're going to Luke chapter 5. And I know you're thinking, how did, how did I know we were going to Luke chapter 5? If you've been in your study uh, this week, which I hope that you have, you have been immersed in the life of Peter. And you may have heard me say this before, and I mean it with all sincerity. It is absolutely the truth. I am a Peter in a female body. I'm a Peter in a female body, and I know it, so I just gravitate to Peter in the Scriptures because I can identify with Peter. I'm all about jumping in the water. I'm all about whacking off the, the, the slave's ear in the garden. I'm all about building Jesus a temple. I'm all about telling Jesus, you know, you don't need to do that. This is what you need to do. I'm a, I'm a Peter. So I identify with Peter, and I hope that you enjoyed this week just as much as I did. But we're going to Luke chapter 5, and we're going to start our reading in verse 1. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around Jesus, the him there is Jesus, and listening to the word of God, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, same place. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he, Peter, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And Jesus sat down, and he began teaching the multitudes from the boat. Now, we're going to stop right there for just a second. I, I love this particular event because my heart's gripped. My heart is gripped by the words at the end of this event that were Uh, going to be looking at together tonight by the words, every time I read it, they left everything and they followed Jesus. They left everything and followed Jesus. When we come to this setting, if you were able to do your study, then you know we kind of worked and we knew the background and we knew the setting. These men were familiar with Jesus already. They had already followed Jesus in that area, listening to his teaching, But there's a different following that's coming in this event. And then there's going to be a different following later after the cross for Peter. So Peter's life is just a series of following Jesus. If if you follow Peter's life closely, you'll see all these challenges. And Jesus just pulling at Peter constantly, follow me. Do you love me more than these? Follow me. Come on, Peter, follow me. And so this event is very unique in the life of Peter because every, and the other disciples who were out there fishing that day, everything that happened in this event was life-changing to their following of Jesus. It was life-changing. So it's important that you and I, we kind of sink our our spiritual teeth into it. Jesus had been teaching. These men were familiar with Jesus. We studied that this week. And so the crowd is pressing in because Jesus has been healing people. Now listen, they weren't coming so much to hear his word, his teaching. They were coming because he had demonstrated the power to heal And he was healing all sorts of sicknesses. And people were drawn to the power that rested on Jesus. They couldn't understand him. They couldn't understand how he was doing these these phenomenal things that he was doing. So they were drawn. His lifestyle drew them to his teaching. So he's teaching on the shoreline. And this crowd began to press in. I mean, they're just pressing to get to Jesus. So the crowd, it was kind of a mad crowd. And all of a sudden, when you're reading the scripture, you notice that these little fishermen, they're on the sides. Their boats were pulled up on the shoreline. While Jesus is teaching, they're washing their nets. So they're busy. They're not in the crowd pressing in on Jesus to listen, to listen with with undivided attention. They're washing their nets, so they're busy. And so Jesus, all of a sudden, the word is at a distance for Peter and the others. But Jesus, and he always does this to Peter, he singles Peter out. He singles him out, like putting a spotlight on him. 
because God's going to use Peter in a mighty way. Jesus knows this. He knows what's coming for Peter. And they're washing their nets, and it's as if Jesus said, you know what, I want to pull him in. I want to pull him in. And so all of a sudden, Peter's washing his nets, empty nets, by the way, and he's washing them, and Jesus gets in to Peter's boat. And he tells Peter, will you put out from shore just a little bit because the crowd's pressing in. And Jesus knew if he gets out, he gets out in the water just a little bit, then he would be safer that way and people maybe could hear him a little better and get a control of the crowd. But what we understand here when you start reading this event is that Jesus wanted Peter's undivided attention. Yes, he wanted Peter to hear, but I believe that Jesus wanted Peter to see as well. He wanted to show Peter something, that the only way that he could show him was to get into his boat that day. And he tells Peter to put out a little bit from land, and he sat down, and now Peter is a captive of Jesus' teaching. I wonder how many of us, when God's Word is being taught, that your mind is somewhere else, you're cleaning your nets in your mind. All the things that you need to be doing, all the busy things and the unfinished things, your nets. How many of us are distracted by so many nets? And it takes Jesus coming in in a personal way and captivating us you see, Peter became a captive of the teaching that day in the boat because now Jesus is in his boat and Peter has engaged him in the teaching. I'm going to need to use your boat, Peter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to convert this boat into a pulpit. And I'm going to need you to row out from shore just a little bit, but I'm going to need you to own this pulpit that I'm in. This is your pulpit. I'm in your boat you, Peter's boat that day became the pulpit of Jesus. And Jesus can invade. This is what I want us to know. Jesus can invade on any level, whether we're fishermen or we're school teachers or we're nurses or doctors, housewives, keepers of the home, secretaries, cooks. It doesn't matter what we do. Jesus can invade, and this is what we see Jesus doing in the life of Peter. He just gets in his boat. He doesn't say, hey, buddy, I'm going to have to use your boat. Do you mind? Jesus just gets in it. And so Peter rolls, rose away a little bit from the land, and let's keep reading in verse 4. And when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now listen, this is when it goes from the teaching. He has asked Peter to row out from the shore, and he's teaching to the multitude. And he's teaching, and Peter's sitting there in the boat with him. And now Jesus directs the conversation, not just to the crowd, but now it's specific and it's personal to Peter. If we'll give the Lord our ear long enough, it will become personal to us. If we'll lay down the busy nets and we'll give our ear personal, just long enough, a personal listening, he will invade. And this is what he says when he finished speaking. He said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Peter answered and said, Master, now he calls Jesus Master. We studied this this week. We worked hard all night and caught nothing. We worked hard all night and we caught nothing. I want you to put at the top of your note sheet the power, the power of bended knee. The power of bended knee. And we're about to see when Peter fully surrendered to the Lord and the series of events that took place, the power in one's life of bended knee. And when I say bended knee, I mean surrender, saying yes to Jesus. Point number one that I want us to see, and I want you to write this down, is the power of obedience. 
the power that we see of obedience. We have the power of bended knee, but the power that this bended knee brings, which is obedience, the power of obedience. Because we see Jesus telling Peter, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, first of all, you don't fish in the day, you fish at night. These men had been up all night long fishing. And this particular body of water, you, you don't fish for success anyway. You don't go out into the deep water. You fish in the shallow water, and you do it at night. So there were several challenges already that we see at the beginning of this encounter. Jesus tells Peter, I want you to put out into the deep water, number one, and it's daytime. And then I want you to let down your nets that you've just finished cleaning, by the way. I want you to get them dirty again. And I want you to put them down into the deep water. But listen, he tells him why. He tells them the purpose. And I love anytime you read God's word, God tells us what his purpose is in the word of God. He tells us what his purpose is from the very beginning. It's going to bring glory to himself. It's going to bring glory to his son. Everything that God does under heaven on the earth is to exalt, is to bring glory to himself, to bring glory to Jesus. That's his purpose. And so he tells Peter, I want you to put down your net in the deep water in the daytime, nets that you've cleaned, but my purpose in it is for a catch. Now listen, Peter's thinking of fish because he's a fisherman. He's a fisherman. He's thinking, you know what? This is a carpenter. Okay, yes, he's a good teacher, and he's doing some good. I've seen him touch and heal my mother-in-law. Now, maybe that was a praise for Peter, and maybe it wasn't. I don't know. I don't know what kind of mother-in-law he had. But he's seen Jesus do some things. He's seen him do some things. And so he tells him, it, it's almost as if, okay, Peter, I, Peter's good with Jesus as long as he stays out of his domain. But now Jesus is going to come into his domain, which is fishing, a carpenter. It's okay, but now you're coming in here and you're going to tell me how to catch fish. Have you ever been a fisherman, Jesus? Have you ever done this before? Are you not listening to what I just told you? We've been up all night long and we've caught nothing. I tell you, the fish are not biting today. They're just not interested today. And Jesus says, put out into the deep water. So Peter doesn't believe that the fish are going to be caught. But what do we see Peter say? And this is so powerful. This is the power of obedience right here. He said, Master, we worked hard all night. And we've caught nothing. I mean, we have given it our best efforts. We have worked hard all night and we caught nothing. But at your bidding, I will let down the nets. I will let down the nets. Do you know that Peter, in sheer obedience, what Peter did to let down his nets in the deep water was not based on faith. He did not believe that fish were there to be caught because he had tried it and he had failed. He believed that there was no fish to catch and that you don't do it in deep water. He knew all of these things. He had all the logic and all the reasoning of why it would not be successful, why it would not work, but yet we read his words. We've worked hard all night and we caught absolutely nothing, but at your bidding, in other words, simply at your word, I will go ahead and let down the net. This is nothing but sheer obedience. There's no faith involved here. There's times in our lives when God's going to come along or we're going to read something in his word and we're not going to believe the benefits of it. We're not going to believe the promises that will follow that. We're not going to believe it. But in sheer obedience, in those moments when we say yes to him, even when we don't believe the results or the outcome to be good, but we just simply say yes to him, even though we don't believe it's going to be good, but we say yes to him, powerful things will happen. And this is what I want us to see in Peter's life. He just did it to appease the Lord. Okay, I'm just going to appease you. I'm going to please you. 
because you have told me to do it. I don't believe it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Almost as if you can't say that I didn't tell you so when we don't catch anything. Listen to 1 Samuel 15, 22. To obey, and it's speaking of God, speaking of the Lord, to obey is better than sacrifice. Why is obedience, when we don't believe the outcome to be good, when we don't trust in what God is doing, what the Lord is doing, when we don't trust it, why is it so powerful? Write the letter A under point number one. Obedience, this kind of obedience, obedience overcomes the deep waters. Obedience will overcome the deep waters. Peter said, we've done all of this and not been successful, but I will do as you say. You see, deep waters was where they were going to be the least successful. The deep waters will become also for us the place of greatest blessing. I will simply, Lord, do as you say. I don't like it. I don't trust in it. I know that this is not the best way. Have you ever told the Lord, I know this is not the best way? I've tried that way, Lord. I'm telling you, I've been there all night long. It's not going to work. But because you've told me to, I will put out into the deep waters. Do you know what Jesus was doing? Jesus is getting Peter in the other boat. There were two boats. He's getting the others further and further away from the shores, further and further away from the crowd. And sometimes Jesus has to do that. He finds us in moments where we have failed. These boys had failed. Peter had failed. They were washing out nets because they'd been down in the, in the shallow waters. They had done everything they knew to be right, and they were coming up with no harvest. They were coming up with no fish, no fruit of their labors, no blessing at all in their work, even though out of Peter's own mouth, his own admission was, we worked hard. We gave it our best. That's what it means. We gave it all that we had. We put all the skill, all the knowledge, everything that we knew to do, we did it. And we still came up empty. And so Jesus, seeing them washing out their nets, and their nets were empty. Do you know that when we fail, our times of failure, even though when we've worked hard and we have given it all that we have, absolutely everything, and we did everything right, everything by the fisherman's book, we did. And we still fail, we still don't succeed. Was it because the Lord was punishing Peter? Or was it because Jesus was trying to bless Peter? Was he trying to do good to Peter? It's the latter we know from the story. Do you know that sometimes God will let you fail even when you give it your all? He will let you fail because he wants to be the one that causes you to succeed. He wants to be the blesser. You know, we're intent oftentimes on, I'll just bless myself. If nobody else will, I will. I will bless myself. I'll be a big blessing in my life because I know I will never fail me. But sometimes we can give our very best even to ourselves, even to feed our families, even to do what's good, what's right. And God will still allow our nets to come up empty. So when Jesus encounters Peter this particular day, his net's empty. Don't you know that God was in heaven and he was just instructing those fish, we're going to get out of the shallow waters today, boys, because there's another fisherman coming and I need to exalt him so that man will be lowered. And you know, for, for Jesus to be exalted, if Jesus is going to be exalted, do you know that we have to be willing to be lowered? We have to be willing to be lowered. And this is what he was doing in the life of Peter. He saw his empty nets and he says, listen, you just put out into the deep waters. Sometimes the Lord is going to call us out into the deep waters. The 
least likely place that you will succeed. And in your mind, in your rational thinking, you're going to be saying everything within you, this is never going to work. Have you ever had God or from God's word tell you clear as day to do something that you know this is what God's word says and you don't believe the good that will come out of it? I can do this, Lord, but I'm telling you, it ain't going to work with so-and-so. It ain't going to work in this situation. It ain't going to work over there. It ain't going to work with this group. It ain't going to work at work. It ain't going to work in my family. There's going to be no fruit, no harvest, nothing good that will come out of it, but simply because you say it, then I'll do it. Do you know that that's the obedience that, that the Lord sits down and he just waits for? They could have walked off that day, but they didn't. Peter didn't argue with him. But if you will just say yes, when he takes you out into those deep waters, that place of least success, that you can't see anything good, if you'll say yes to him, do you know that that obedience, what will follow just that simply saying yes, even when you don't believe it, that will give you the power, the courage, the blessing to overcome deep waters. Because you might be in deep waters right now. If you're not, trust me, there'll be a, what, a day when you'll find yourself headed out into the deep waters of life. And you say, there, I, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know where the blessing's going to come from. I don't know where the supply is going to come from. Because it simply is not going to come from here. But Jesus, I'm going to obey you even though I don't believe you. Have you ever told the Lord that? I have. I have many times. I'll say yes to you, Lord, but there is no way that something good's not coming out of this. There's no way. I'll, I'll wave my white flag of surrender, but there is no way nothing as good is coming out of this. Can't be possible. But that obedience, when we say yes to him, it will overcome the deep waters. Obedience, I want you to write this down. Obedience is not always motivated by faith. We think we have to have faith to say yes to him, but we don't. Obedience is not always motivi motivated by faith. Many times it's simply based on thus saith the Lord. Many times it's just based on thus saith the Lord. At your bidding, Peter said, I will let down the net. I will let down the net. Let's keep reading. And verse 6, and when they had done this, done what? Obeyed. Obeyed. Now we know that Andrew and Peter, they fished together. So if Andrew's in the boat, it would make sense to say Andrew's in the boat. But it's not always so clear right here in this particular passage. But we know that there were the others in the other boat. But he said, when they'd done this, when he obeyed, when Peter said, let's put down the nets into the deep water, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. The letter B, write the second point under this point, this first point. Obedience not only overcomes the deep waters, but obedience brings revelation of the heart. It brings revelation of the heart. What do you mean, what's in your heart? Sometimes, do you know that the Lord has to squeeze us or shake us or get us out of our comfort zone a little bit to expose what's in our heart? And this is what he's doing to Peter. He's doing this to Peter. In sheer obedience, when Peter doesn't want to, I have disgruntledly followed the Lord many times. He's kick, I'm kicking and I'm dragging and he's pulling and he's pulling and I'm saying, I'm going to do this, but I want you to know I'm not happy about it. I've told the Lord that many times. And we can overcome the deep waters, but do you know in those moments after we say yes, and it was after he obeyed, all of a sudden this great quantity of fish comes in. I mean, it's a great quantity of fish. This revelation, it sets our heart ripe to reveal what's in it. Read with me. Their nets begin to break, and they signal to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. 
Now, whether they're still on the shore or they've come out, we don't really know. But he signals for them to come. And they came and they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. They began to sink. I love the insight here. Do you know sometimes sharing the blessings of the Lord is is the answer for sinking? Sometimes we can just sink under what the Lord is doing and the good that He's doing. And in Christendom today, if we would just be willing to share the blessings of the Lord, that's the answer for sinking many times. Many times just sharing the blessing. And so this boat's called over this other boat and, and because it's so much, the nets are breaking and they're dumping it in these boats and the boats are so full, they begin to sink and all of a sudden, Peter's eyes as he sees this, Scripture tell us, tells us, and when he saw this, verse 8, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. Do you know it's one thing to have empty nets and to fill your nets yourself? Anybody can do that. But when your nets are empty and you struggle and you struggle and you still come up empty even though you've given your all. And then when the Lord brings revelation to your mind, His Word to your mind, and you know I've got an area that I'm not obeying in, but I'm going to step out and I'm going to say yes and I'm going to obey you in it. Do you know that when Peter thought that his problem was how to fish, he thought that was the problem of the situation, that Jesus wasn't fishing correctly. He thought the problem was the method. He thought the problem was the method. But it wasn't the method. The problem was Peter's heart. We can get all caught up in the method and how the church or how things are being done at work or in our family. We can get caught up and think that the problem is the method. The problem is the way that things are being done. Because that's what the enemy does. He tries to get us to focus on the wrong thing. But when Peter said yes to Jesus, all of a sudden what was really the problem was Peter. Because Peter falls on his knees, and when he saw that to his amazement, he fell at the feet of Jesus and listened to what Peter says. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Oh, Lord. Peter, listen, what did Peter see that day? Yes, he saw fish, but what did Peter see about himself? All of a sudden, it wasn't that the fish wasn't biting. It wasn't about how hard he had been working. It wasn't about the method of fishing. It wasn't about the fish. All of a sudden, it became about Peter and Peter's heart. Do you know that every struggle, every challenge... Every opportunity to obey the Lord will serve a purpose in your walk, and that is to surface or expose anything about your heart that needs to be right. Peter had never seen himself as a sinner before. He was just a fisherman that worked hard. He didn't need the Lord. But when he saw Jesus filling his net, when he experienced the filling of Jesus, all of a sudden Peter saw his own emptiness. He saw his own emptiness. So obedience, that sheer obedience will bring revelation. Obedience, and this is your nugget here, obedience has the unique power to reveal the condition of our heart. Obedience has the unique power to reveal the condition of the heart especially this obedience that we're talking about when we don't want to. Because on the other side, I think that if God, if God, if we knew what God was doing, I believe that one thing we would see when we're faced with a decision to obey or not to obey, God is up in heaven saying, oh, if you could see what I could see, if you could just see on the other side of this, If you'll just say yes, if you'll just drop your nets, if you just head out into the deep waters, 
It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your way is. It doesn't matter your past experiences. We want to base everything on what God wants to do on our past experiences. But, but God, this is what I know. I want to show you a new thing. I want to show you something you don't know. Have you ever fished in deep water, Peter? Have you ever put out your net in deep water in the day? I want to show you new things if you'll just say yes. And when we say yes, when we don't want to, all of a sudden, the real problem will surface. And deep down inside of us is an issue that it's so deep. Only God knew it was there. We didn't even realize it was there. And all of a sudden, this obedience, it positions us in a way that God can move and He can work. He can bring those fish. He can bring that sight up to the surface. And here it is, this deep issue that took God so long, waiting for the perfect time to invade our life. And all of a sudden, as that issue begins to rise, it's like God says, oh, there it is. Look what was in that heart of yours that you didn't know before. And we'll realize what a sinner how wrong I've been, Lord. How wrong I have been in this, God. When I thought my way was right, when I thought I was headed the right direction, when I thought I was doing everything right, and I've been so wrong. Thank you for positioning me in such a way that you could show it to me. You see, obedience will overcome the deep waters, it will also bring revelation about yourself that you never knew. Most of the time, people don't need to tell us what's wrong with other people. We usually can point that out, right? It's ourselves that we're missing. You see, these situations, the deep waters, the empty nets, it just shines a spotlight on what's in our heart. And Peter fell. He's at the feet of Jesus when he makes this confession. I am unworthy for you to be in my boat. Depart from me. In other words, don't bless me. Leave me here because I am unworthy to be in your presence. I'm unworthy for you to bless me because I doubted you. I am a sinner. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve to be in your presence. The next thing let her see that obedience does is op obedience increases our faith. We want faith before we obey, but it comes after. God, you give me all the faith. You just fill me with faith, and I am your girl. I am it. I'm all over it. I'm all over this assignment. You just give me the faith. And see, we base faith on a feeling, don't we? I want to feel it. I want to feel the fish. I want to see the fish. I want to see it. I want to see it first. In my house, I have this fish pond, a little courtyard. And the water's murky, like you would think it would be. And you can go and stand over all day long, and I go, fishy, fishy, fishy. I know you're in there. It's about 12 or 13 of them. So I had the grandbabies out there yesterday, and I said, come on, you help Grammy feed the fish. So I went out to the little pond. And Braylon, he's only two, but he's just like a boy. He got a little food in his hand and went, bam! <laughs> Kinsley, dainty little girl, she's just sprinkling, just real dainty. And I said, now we got to back up. And so we got up on, on Grammy's little porch and we were looking because we got up high and I said, watch now, let's watch. We got to be real patient. And all of a sudden, this beautiful orange color and a yellow, they begin to come to the surface because they had thrown something that would send them upward. You see, this is what Jesus did with Peter that day. Peter, you don't believe that good is down in this deep waters because you can't see it. But if you'll obey me, if you'll obey me, then I will draw this goodness up to the surface. And if you'll obey me when you can't see, then I'll allow you to see. I'll allow you to see what was there all along. You just couldn't see it. 
Jesus fetches it and he pulls it up, but only after we've said yes to him. And Peter had said yes to him. He fell at Jesus' feet. And it says when he saw this, it increased his faith. If Peter had not chosen to obey, I believe with all my soul that, you know, when Jesus said put out from the shore, it wouldn't have been so good for the crowd to hear anymore. But it was perfect for Peter because Jesus wants to get us beyond just the hearing. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. He had Jesus in the boat. He had the word being taught, and he's listening now because he's a captive audience. And you know, if we listen long enough and we say yes to him, we keep saying yes to him, do you know that eventually faith will follow? And the next time he tells you, child, we're going out into the deep waters, you'll say, I'm ready. I'm ready. There won't be any excuses. There won't be any past experience that you're looking back and you're remembering all the times you failed. Do you do that with the Lord when he gives you an assignment or you feel like you hear something out of his word being taught or you feel like he's motivating you to do something? You want to go back to all the times that you have not succeeded. We like to whoop out our list of failures, don't we? And we do that with each other. We do that with our spouses. We do that with our family. We do that with our bosses, our coworkers. We like to pull out those failures and we base what we do on past experiences rather than Jesus at hand and what his word tells us to do. The last point under this first point, the letter D, obedience empowers us to follow even if it cost us everything. Obedience will empower us to follow even if it cost us everything. You see, now Peter is on bended knee before the Lord. The shoreline is different now for Peter. Physically, it's the same shoreline. They row the boats up and looked what happened. He said, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized Peter and all his companions because of the catch of fish. Verse 10, and also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Peter. And Jesus says to Peter, now listen, he addresses Peter. This encounter was for Peter. But I want you to know that Peter's encounter with the Lord impacted others around him, those in his inner circle, those in the situation. Do you know that your obedience can impact others to follow Jesus? It can impact others just by saying yes to him. See it with me. And Jesus says to Peter, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed Jesus. They left everything and followed Jesus. Do not fear, he says. From now on, you'll be catching men. All of a sudden, when they come to shore, they're willing to follow Jesus. They left everything and they followed Jesus. The second point, Roman number two, Roman, Roman numeral number two, let me get that right. We know that there's a power in obedience, but there's also fear, the enemy of obedience. The enemy of obedience for Peter was fear. When Jesus says to Peter, do not fear, this enemy of obedience, do not fear Peter. This will be a struggle for Peter until after Pentecost. It is going to be a struggle for Peter. He's going, to, he's going to strike out in fear. Fear is going to move him and motivate him. It's going to cause him to deny the Lord three times in the most crucial hour of Jesus' earthly life. And so he doesn't address the others. They're just privy to see what God is doing in the life of Peter. And because of Peter's decisions, their lives are changed. Their lives are changed by Jesus' encounter with Peter. And he says, don't be afraid. Do you know what fear? Don't fear. Do you know what fear there means? It means, it speaks of a present condition. A present condition. 
Fear not, Jesus says. In other words, don't be afraid anymore. Stop being afraid. Peter had a present fear. This is speaking in the present tense. He's saying, I want you to stop being afraid. You're afraid right now. I want you to stop living in the bondage of fear. Fear of what? Saying yes to me. Fear of following me. Fear of trusting me. Fear of doing what I tell you to do even when you can't understand what I'm doing or why I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it. Fear, Peter. I want you to stop being afraid. I want you to stop speaking of a present condition. You see, when Peter fell at the feet of Jesus, all of a sudden, he's in a position not only to see himself, but he sees who Jesus is. And when he sees who Jesus is, because now he calls him Lord, when he left the shore, Jesus was master teacher. But in the boat, because of obedience, now he's Lord. He's Savior. He's Lord. He's not just a teacher. He's my master. Now I'm going to follow him. He's in a position. But what's going to be the enemy? Do you know we all will have enemies to obedience? Maybe Peter's was based on past experiences, and usually our fear is. But he tells Peter, I want you to stop being afraid. I want you to stop being afraid. And do you know the interesting thing about this? That the other encounters that Jesus had with these same men, Jesus is the one that said, follow me. He spoke it, follow me. I want you to follow me. Take up your cross, follow me. But when this happens, this power of obedience, this power of bended knee at the feet of Jesus, Jesus is not saying, follow me. He's not beckoning them to follow me. Why? They're simply wanting, choosing to follow him on their own. Jesus is saying, come on, follow me this time. Why? Because they've had a heart change. They've had a life change. Something's different. It's the power of bended knee before the Lord. You see, God wants to relate to us based on the power of love, not the power of fear. He wants to relate to us based on the power of His love, not the power of fear. And if we'll understand that God, the Lord, relates to us based on the power of His love, we won't have a problem when we get back to the shores of man. Because it's the same shoreline. And I've often wondered, did the crowd stay? Because Jesus couldn't get a break from them. And when it says they left everything and followed Jesus, here is what I don't want us to miss. When Jesus got into the boat, their nets were empty. They were empty. They needed full nets. They were fishermen. And so they go out, and Jesus is in the boat, and simply out of obedience, all this amazing catch takes place, and their boat can't contain it. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to change your your course. You're still going to be a fisherman, but now I'm going to make you fisher, a fisherman of souls. And it says they left everything to follow Jesus. Here is what I don't want us to miss. When they get back to shore, these boats come back. These boats are filled with fish. Now they don't stop to wash the nets. They don't stop to count the fish. They don't stop to count the goods. They leave everything and follow Jesus. Now here's what I don't want us to miss. Because they fell at the feet of Jesus, Peter surrenders to him as Lord. When he comes back after the surrendering, now following Jesus is more costly than it was before. Why? Because now he's walking away from two boats of fish he didn't have before. What's he showing us? When you surrender to Jesus, 
you're going to have to walk away. It means walking away even from that which you think is good. Even from that which you think, this is going to make me a lot of money. This is going to make me successful. This is going to help my family. This could do so much more. Look at all the blessings. Look at my boat is full. Why would I ever want to leave this? But that wasn't a problem for Peter now. Because if he had followed Jesus from empty nets, what would the cost be in that? They're just walking away from empty nets. I didn't have anything to lose. I didn't have anything to lose following you before. But now that I've fallen on my knees, I mean really fallen on my knees, I have so much more that I'm walking away from now. They left everything, it says. Boats full of fish. There's a story that I love, and with this I'll close our time together. It's a story that I love. There was a young, a young emperor. He was just a child when he became emperor. And a queen comes to visit his land. And he gives her a gift from his country. He gives her a prized jewel. Prized jewel. And he's but a child. And the jewel was very valuable. The queen goes back to her homeland by boat. Years and years passed. The queen is now very old. And the emperor is traveling. And he sets an appointment to go and to see this queen. And during his visit, he said, Could I see, I just want to see that jewel that I gave you so long ago when I was a child. She said, sure. She said, we keep it in the safe place. It's locked away under, under key and it's guarded with the other jewels, crown jewels. So she sends her people to go and get it and they bring it back and it's in a beautiful box and she hands it to him to see and he opened the, the, the emperor opens it up. He's now an older man. He opens it up and he says, wow. And he takes it over to the light. And she said, you know, it could be yours again. I know you were but a child when you gave it. And he looks at the value of it. And he turns around and he said, you know, I was but a child when I gave you this the first time. He said, but now I give it to you again knowing full well the cost involved. I think this is where Peter was. The first time, he didn't realize the cost involved. Peter, you're walking away from all the fish in the sea. You're walking away from everything that you've ever known, everything that you've been comfortable with, you're walking away from. And until you and I get down to the gut of this with the Lord. We'll always be washing and cleaning our empty nets because Jesus wants to do so much more. But he's waiting for us to bend our knee. It's not just bowing the knee in moments of crisis, in moments of struggles with our faith, our great miraculous things. But it's living on that bended knee every day of our life, surrendering to Him as Lord, fully as Lord, living on the words, thus saith the Lord. At the feet of Jesus, we won't have a problem to overcome the deep waters. And it will not be a struggle. Jesus won't have to pull us to follow Him. We'll want to follow Him even if walking away is the greatest cost ever in our life as it was Peter. Peter never had so much to walk away from his life as he did that day. And Jesus didn't have to ask him to do it. Oh, to have that kind of faith. Amen.